presentation. But yeah, so let's just get started and let's go over what dynamic analysis is. So I'm just gonna, I kind of showed this slide last week, but it applies more so towards dynamic analysis because essentially what you're doing is you're leveraging the program's execution to gain additional knowledge. So back, if you remember when we were talking about static analysis, we have to kind of remember the register states in our heads. We have to like trace and work backwards kind of on our own, I guess like from our own memory, which is useless because a computer will tell you anything you want to know about it at any state of the program with a debugger. Um, and that is, and it'll literally show you the exact values for the register state, the heap layout, any sort of memory information you want. You can inspect and examine anywhere you want in virtual memory uh, inside a debugger. And again, a debugger is just one of the many dynamic analysis tools we have. Um, on top of just having a debugger, there are other um, types of APIs that you can use consisting of um, symbolic execution engines that'll let you modify the state and actually like I'll kind of work through that, that with you later. I'll, look, I'll kind of explain that later because it's kind of detailed. But yeah, there are other, basically, there are other APIs and Python things that exist <coughs> on top of just debugging. That's, that was last week. Let's not worry about that. So, generally, here are like the debuggers that I recommend you use. GDB is fine. Personally, I use um, PwnDBG, which is basically like a wrapper around GDB, and it has like a bunch of cute little Python things that uh, show you very clearly what's going on. Uh, I'll use that in like my demos today and with like the practice materials. But yeah, things you can do in a debugger. Kind of went over this, but you can examine memory and you can set breakpoints. Who here knows what a breakpoint is? Okay, most of you guys know. I, I won't really cover. Who doesn't know? Who wants me to explain it? Because it's real quick. Nobody? Just explain it anyway. All right, I'm gonna explain it anyway. So a breakpoint is basically an instruction that is inserted into the program by your debugger that tells execution to stop. And at that point, your debugger leverages this pause to show you everything that's going on <coughs> in the state at that specific instruction. Um, and then after you're finished with that instruction, um, basically like it swaps it out. It's like, oh yeah, that instruction that you broke at, I'm just gonna swap it out with the real one and then continue execution, It'd be great. Uh, yeah, so you can set breakpoints. You can look at different memory off offsets. So if you remember last week, you know, I was talking about local variables on the stack. If you wanna look at literal values of those things, you can just use a debugger and type in stack and it'll show you how the stack looks. Show you every byte at every offset. Um, you don't have to remember the commands now, just like, I'll show you the commands later, but uh, just keep that in the back of your head. And so once you set a breakpoint, you can, you can also step through instructions. So if you remember last week when we were reversing that binary, we got to, um, let's say, if you guys remember the part when I was talking about calling a function, it's like, oh, what do you do to call a function? Well, there's a calling convention, and in that calling convention, you move things to uh, the first argument to R RDI and the second argument to RSI. Well, you can watch all of that. You can step through it instruction by instruction at a time and see how the, the registers change and see how um, your program layout changes. And so it's basically a really easy way to reverse because you can look at every single thing that's happening very slowly and you don't have to remember anything because your debugger shows you everything. So it's a neat trick. You don't have to use your brain as much. Um, you can attach to a process. So if you think about it, practical use for a debugger, um, you don't, if you want to debug something like later in a program where you're like testing an exploit or something, you, you don't want to start it from the beginning, or you could, and it'd be fine. But typically what I do, this happens most of the time when I'm testing an exploit, or use, when I'm using a debugger, is I attach to the process. So every process has a PID, or a process ID. And so you can just say, debugger, attach this process at this point, right now, and then let me start um, looking at execution and understanding what exactly is going on. 
Um, so yeah, you can attach to processes at different ex like points of execution instead of just starting everything here in debugger itself by using a PID. Um, and you can set register values and you can set memory values. And this is pretty powerful because like you can edit memory, which you know isn't that crazy because you know you're running locally. But if you remember like during CTF challenges, for some certain for certain CTF challenges, you need a register value to be a certain value to move on, right? Like you know those checks that we saw last week. Um, like, remember those comparison instructions before jumps? Like, you can literally set those values to be the same. And then you can see what happens to, like, if you go to the win state. Um, yeah. So, little tricks like that that help you in CTF. Or generally, when you're just trying to understand what's going on, um, and understanding, like, all the different program states, and you just want to say, like, okay, let me invert this value, so I can go to, yeah, you have a question, Richard? Oh yeah, just, what is geth? Uh, geth is, like, similar to PwnDebug. It's, oh. I, I learned geth from Kyle. It's, like, a simpler version of PwnDebug. Um, Jeb. Is it Jeb? It's Jeb. Geth is something else, then. Yeah, I'm not sure what it is. Um, okay. Is it spelled J-E-B? Yeah, Jeb. 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 I thought it was geth, dude. Is geth something? Maybe I'm wrong. That's pretty embarrassing, but anyway, yeah. Next slide. So again, here's just the actual commands to do these things in phone debug or GDB. This works in either debugger. You guys, do you guys have a debugger? Uh, cool. Cause like most people have GDB. I I think you guys were t told to have some tools beforehand. Yes. Uh, which tools were those? Just so I know. I don't. I don't. And uh, debuggers. Binja. Anger, cool. That's that's needed. Binja? Yeah. Binja's fine, as long as you have some sort of disassembler. You don't need both. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you want to examine memory, it's X, and then the, name, the star, the address, and that'll give you the value at that memory address. And then you can set a breakpoint, which is really easy. Just type in B and the symbol or the address. So let's say you want to set a breakpoint at the main function, you just type in B space main in your debugger and it sets a breakpoint there. Um, if you, do you guys understand memory mappings? You guys understand that? You know how that works kind of? As in? Like in general, just virtual memory? Um, okay, so virtual memory, uh, it's kind of a detour, but essentially, um, the libraries that you, your program needs access to, or like needs to access, um, is basically loaded in memory, along with your program or that you're executing, and it refers to that other chunk of memory when it wants functions from that library. So if you want to look at those offsets when things are occurring locally, you can in a debugger, or if you want to look at those memory mappings or those page ranges, and you want to understand where is this library loaded, right? Why are you giving me that look? I'm curious where you're going with this. That's it. That's all I was saying. You can just look at these mappings of debugger. That's all. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to, like, talk about virtual memories and then OS class. Not qualified. Yeah. You said symbol a couple of times. What, in this context, what does symbol mean? Symbol means, like, the, the, a literal, like, you know how programs have symbols, like, main? And, like, if you, if you look at some binary and you type in nm on your terminal space, the binary name, you can look at all the symbols. It's basically all your function names. Uh, you can just think about that for now. It's all your function names. So if you wanted to set a breakpoint at the win function, you do b space win. And your debugger would set a breakpoint there, so if execution ever got there, it would halt. And then you look at program state or whatever you wanted to do. Yeah. So here is lost. Oh, so Richard. Yeah, uh, I saw some kind of more advanced commands in like the source code for Angel Heap. Oh, yeah? So it was uh, doing things like printing out uh, specific structures. Oh, um, yeah, like... And so on. Okay, uh, like the heap command? Yeah, and, and I'm <coughs> curious, uh, is there like a resource somewhere that's kind of like a walkthrough of more advanced GD, uh, GDB commands? Um... You know where you, it's more hands-on? CTF write-ups, like... Yeah. Yeah, like, I, I don't know. I don't know of, like... Honestly, I don't need to get more advanced than examining memory, and heap doesn't even work half the time, so then I just look at the heap. Uh, yeah, that bugs me, too, like... Yeah. It would be nice to have something more stable. Yeah. Um, you could write it. Right. But yeah. Um. 
I don't know, I don't really have an answer for like a good go-to tutorial. No one's really made that. If you want to make it, you could, though. Again. Yeah. Um, again, useful commands. So let's go through an offset challenge. Um, yeah, you guys have a disassembler and a debugger, right? Uh, and you guys have the repo, um, osiris.link slash dyne. Yeah. Uh, okay, so this binary is called stirops.bin. Should be there for you guys to access. And I'm gonna get set up. If you guys have questions, lab members are at corners. And Jerry. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, so like you can ask them questions for like setup and stuff. I'm gonna get this set up by myself. So like, give it two minutes to get this, get this started. Oh, yes, are the slides up to when, uh, No, these are my slides. Like, these kind of have nothing to do. I will release these slides after. Okay. Yeah. The slides for last year for static analysis are up, though. Yeah. Yeah, if you guys have questions, again, people are around. Do we just need the bin file for now? Yes, drop stop in. That's it. And have y'all looked at straps up in before? I know you have, but let's go over it again. If, if the link isn't working for you, the Cyrus link, uh, change HTTPS to HTTP. It's not working over HTTPS. Yeah. Security. Uh, I'll give it, I'll give it another minute. Who has the setup? Who's ready to go? If you're not, it's okay, because I'll just do it for you. So, whatever. Let's do it. Alright, thanks. Um, which thing bigger? Uh, honestly, I should have set that up. Again, new terminal, don't know how to increase the size of things. Okay. The shortcut doesn't work. What shortcut? Control plus. Yeah, no, it doesn't work. Control shift plus. Can't got me hooked on this new like X terminal thing. <coughs> it's not it's not X terminal, it's something else. And like you, you have to go to this config oh, file maybe. to change the things. No, anyway. That's how I screwed up. Oh, okay, yeah. Work stuff gets mixed in, you write the wrong slides, it's great. But Jeff has a uh, really good uh, one liner quick install. Oh, okay. Uh, and it installs in like five seconds. Okay, cool. Um, what? What? That's not. Hey Kyle, can I get your help with something? Just Kyle, can I get your help with something? I have broken my ninja. Oh, beautiful. Um, Does anyone have any problem with this setup? It's the Python interpreter file. And, um, so we need a... I looked at the slash lib, I couldn't find it. Do which Python 3? You said debugger. If you don't have a disassembler, then you can just look at my screen. Uh, just, uh, no, not now. No. That's for later. John's gonna do that demo for you guys. I'm just gonna introduce you to it. And then you want something. So GDB will let you go through the program dynamically, and then you want to use GDB to configure the program. You might need to use it. Like or binary. Um, check your. You can use binary in general. Dot GDB or your GDB init in your home directory. And what I install. Um, Geth probably just uh, wrote there. Can, or Jeff, you to Jeff probably just wrote to that file. Right. To just comment that out. Yeah, I just asked yeah, if I should know a little bit. Yeah. Like, I tried the dev, I'm not going to do that again. Yeah, they just pushed their um, stable, so. Um, 
Dev is now unstable. Uh, no, it's not going to work in the subsystem. Um, no, because uh, the subsystem doesn't have a graphical uh, and it's a graphical program. I'm just using the problem. Uh, download for Windows. You can still, you can just open it straight from Windows. Okay. Uh, This is the third time that we've done hacking. Ideally, if you want to run a different program, where we had like set up your own number or something. Well, I, honestly, I just need to find my config file and then we can. Yeah. So, I mean, it's so where is it? Yeah. I think it's called .xrinitrc or xrinitrc or something. So just, That's um, something yeah. else. Oh, okay. that will make your text bigger, but it will make everything bigger. But that's okay for now, right? It, it might break some things. Like it, make, it might make some things unusual. Okay. Um, yeah. It's called. Uh, Oh yeah, that's like the default. Really need to install. Uh, yeah. 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 Well, I yeah. That they recommend all the freshmen install. Uh, I hope. No. I hope. No. Uh, I try. I try. I try. I try. Yeah, I'll just move on. Me and Kevin calls it that one, but I try. John later. Wait, you made it smaller. But as I'm saying. Really? But, so no, but that's your entire env on the screen. You might want to clear it. Oh, what's going to be is like when you compile the program in C, it's going to be all like binary, right? So when you touch the debugger, you can observe the uh, the assembly instructions. Yeah, and like what's happening. And like if you have a side fault on a C program, it's like oh your program compiled, so you don't have any syntax errors, but like you have some sort of error that's causing it to crash. So you want to debug it. You would attach a debugger to it and then find where the crash is happening and what's happening before. Right. Yeah. So last time, instead of using a debugger, we looked at the we, we just looked at the assembly like completely, right? But what the debugger lets you do is say like run the program and observe the assembly as it's running. And so what's what's helpful is like. Last time we had to like reverse engineer so what the arguments was, where you could just break. Can right, I look up the thing? Call yeah, sure. Ask it to print what's ever in the register. Maybe you could just see what's in what's the argument instead of reversing it. Right. So it's, re it's recommended to do both. You know, have it open, have open the full assembly. If you want, both, reverse it by hand. Uh, but if not, reverse it using the debug. Like, you know, after dynamic analysis. Kind of weird. A lot more. I don't like to just read the assembly and figure stuff out. I like to just go through GDP and ask, like, what is it? For me, it's a long time. It's, it's alright, John. Yeah. I kind of like to figure out yeah. what terminal is using. Okay, it's, it's, okay. It's, let me just move up. It's like, <laughs> it's not okay. <laughs> it's not, but, like, it's fine for now. So. Alright, uh, let's just, I'm just going to start, start this off. So, like, again, the thing that I like to do when I start reversing is just to run the thing. Like just run. First thing you should do is to run is run the binary. So strop stop bin. It says enter your flag. So I'm gonna type in random gibberish and then see what happens. Okay, it says no. 
Alright, that's it. I like that. I ran it. Let's just look at it in Ninja first. Let's start with some outputs. Uh, a car star just stood out. Stood, yeah, so, yeah. So, basically prints it out, and you know that because you saw it. And so this means that when we typed in gibberish, we came to this block. Just note that. That's all that happened. Alright. So, you also see correct in the corner. For some people, it's hard to see. But that says correct. Uh, maybe I'll zoom in. Yeah, see that? Yeah. This is correct. <laughs> so we want to figure out how do you get there? You know? Simple. How do I get to correct? Because that's the flag. So the first thing you do is you check this check, right? What what is this check doing? Well, this comparison has to be false. Right, because that's the red block. So what is an EAX at this point, and what is this number? OX2F, you know? And so, you can do a thing where you just type in D, or maybe it's not D. Is it N? No, that's not it. We'll just display as unsigned decimal. Okay, so that's 47. Because um, it used to be a hex digit before. You guys seen this? So, it's 47. Oh, can you do that? Um, let's exit out. Who needs function names anyway? You can do it on the right side Ah, cool. Alright. So, general idea. How do you get to block here. And now this has to be false. So you have to compare EAX and 47. Immediately you see RBP minus OX4 is moved into EAX. EAX is a register. You guys remember all this stuff, right? Very cool. <coughs> so RB, what, what's RBP minus OX54? What is it conceptually? Who knows? Like, who has an idea of it? What is it? Um, but like RBP minus hex fifty four. Is that moving uh, RBP like moving the, the memory address down by that much? Well, no. Oh yeah, yeah, that's kind of what's happening. It's basically the local variable that's there. Yeah. Yeah. So that's this. That's what this is. But yeah. yeah Wolf game. Right. It's right. Yeah. So relative address and memory counting from base one. Exactly. It's exactly. It. RBP is what's the relative address? Minus hex fifty four. Yeah. And then RBP is a... No, the whole thing is a relative address, that's what I meant to say. Okay. Calculated from the base pointer minus x54. But I guess the size question for your face would be like, what do you usually have under the base pointer? Yeah, like what's on the stack? Like usually what do we find under the base pointer on the stack? Um, also, it's an absolute address. It's, that address is relative to RBP, but that resolves to an absolute address. It's not relative to its location. Yeah. But, but what do you usually find under the base pointer on the stack? Yeah, you guys know? In general, like the stack frame? Hmm? Yes. Good job, Omar. Variables. That's a local variable. Sick. So, what is in this local variable? So, we see this jump instruction. It's not a conditional jump. So, you just get to this basic block immediately. So not too interesting. But then you see zero is in hex 54. Oh, okay. So zero is in RBP minus hex 54. You move zero into EAX. And then you, you check if 47 is, or you check if EAX is 47. And you say jump BE. So jump BE is jump below, right? Or equal. Below or equal. So that means that if you're below or equal 47, which we are at the, the first iteration of this, then you go to this block. Fine. So the question is, how do you get this to be greater than 47? Well, if we zoom out a little bit. So how do, we, how do you get the uh, addresses to display on the left side? 
The left side? Oh, it's oh. in the bottom right hand corner under options. Oh. Ninja. Sai, you can show it on the screen. Uh, yeah, options. Yeah, cool. So, I'm just going to quickly show you that here you see add 1 to RBP minus hex 54. Right. So you can kind of like tell like jump equal, if it's equal here, then you, uh, if this is equal, then you jump. And if it's not equal, you fail. And this check has to be true. Correct. So this check has to be true. And then you're going to increment by one. So to solve this problem, all you have to do is to get it to increment 47 times. All right. General idea, right? But then it's just like, you know, if we were doing this last week, then you'd have to sit and we'd have to read all this code, but I don't want to do that because like it's way too hard. So all we got to do is open up a debugger and intelligently, let's set a breakpoint here. We want to stop here because remember, okay, how about this? Like, what were some of the things that I said you could do with the debugger? Breakpoint. Breakpoint, what else? What do you think would be like useful to like solve this? No, no, just this values. Right, we can edit register values. So, you have a general idea of what I'm about to do. I'm about to break here, and then edit the register value of edx or eax. Whatever, just gotta make sure they're equal. But here's the thing, you still gotta think practically, like, you wanna know what the flag is. So, if you just increment some value, or like, change some value, you're not gonna know. You're just going to know how to like, pass the check. So you gotta think a little bit, which one is my input, and which one is the one that I wanna be equal to? You know, like which one's the actual flag? So, just remember that. That's it. So, oopsies. So many different things. All right, I'll move this here for now. So now we're in our debugger, and, God, I think that address was 40798. So, I forgot which pain I am. Okay, so I'll break at OX 400798, right? So, let's start the program. You can, do that. you can do that by typing in run, or just R. So I typed in R, and it says enter the flag. Typical. So do you know what I'm gonna do? I'm just going to enter a ton of A's. Yes? Um, explain the star. Um, okay. So, like, basically, you want to... This is basically what you have to do. Is if, you, if you're not specifying a symbol, then you want to break at the exact address. You need to, like, say star beforehand. Just so it knows, like, it's not a name. This is, like, I don't need to resolve the name. This is just an address, right? It's, it's a dereference, so you're saying break at this address. Yeah, I know, but, like... Okay. So... Um, the reason I'm going to give it a ton of A's is this is like a basic reversing strategy, like A is OX61. That's just the ASCII value in hex of what a capital A is. So you're just looking in memory, or like you can look for that pattern, and you know generally where your input is going. That's all you're doing. Like you look at, you can inspect memory, to type in a ton of A's, and if you see a ton of A's in memory or a ton of OX61's in memory, you know, okay, that's where my input's going. So that's all we're doing. So let me just, yep, super complicated reverse engineering right here. Okay, I think that's a good point. Uh, OX41 side. 41? Okay, I was thinking lowercase a, my bad. Yeah. All right. So, wow, I typed in so many A's, I thought it was a command. Okay, anyway. So um, we stopped at this comparison, right? So this is a general, this is what I kind of wanted to show you guys. Like, here is the exact program. Here are all of my registers. All right? And so, let's look at this instruction. You're comparing EDX and EAX. So let's just look at the values of, of first of all, you know that that's just, a, these two registers are just the 32-bit representations of the 64-bit represent, like the 64-bit yeah. address, or registers. So, RAX and RDX. RAX is OX41. Hey, that's A, good to know. <coughs> and RDX is OX66. Okay, so which one do we want to edit? 
Or like, which one is the real flag? Or part of the real flag? Or could be? Yeah, one and R D. Right, because you know that you inputted a ton of A's. So it's comparing your input with this. And quickly, um, if we open up Python, and um, you just do hex, or just, if you do chr, you guys know what chr is, right? OX66. Yeah, lowercase f. I know it's hard to see from back there. But you get lowercase f, which is like, that makes sense if you think of flag format. F L A G. So, what do you do? Well, you can, basically, if you were just doing this, you could write f down, right? And then you can just set. Here, let me clear the screen so you guys can see the top. So what you do is you set um, R A X to R D X. I know it's like really small, but you kind of have to bear with me. Is that, is that a pound sign? Uh, this is a dollar sign. Oh, oh, dollar sign. sign. Yeah. So if you set this right, okay. Notice. Rx value is not OX66. The same value is RDX. Right? And so, there you go. It's equal now. So what'll happen? It'll increment, right? That value will increment, and we can do this 47 times. That's a way, and we didn't really have to reverse at all. All you did was you broke, you set a breakpoint, you just looked. And you saw, okay, this check has to be true, so let me just make the check true and then note the value. So done, you know it's F, right? So, like, let's not do this 46 more times. Um, let me just show you a debugger script that I wrote, which is really simple, and it's really, really bad. But, hey, it gets the job done. So, script.gdb. This is a GDB script. Okay, yeah. Crazy, right? But all it is is the commands. And so I set a breakpoint here at 407.95. Then I ran the program. Then I set RAX to RDX, and then I continued. And it's funny, it looks like I typed all this out, but really I didn't. Like, I was too lazy to write a for loop, so that I just, like, I wrote it once, like, yanked it, and then hit P a ton of times, and so I just copied and pasted it a ton of times. But, like, yeah, I didn't, like, sit and type all that. But if you run this script, What? I'm gonna do all that. All right. It says correct at the bottom. You have to start the debugger to do it, or can you run it from an uh, existing process? Uh, I just started it with the debugger. I just executed it, and so there you go. Like that's a way to do it with the. Yeah. What's up? So what you 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 doing the thing forty seven times where you're making um R R A X equal to R D X? Yeah, that's all I did. Why forty seven times? Oh, uh, because if you remember the check. Yeah. Uh, it checked if it was... Oh, yeah, okay. right? Okay. Okay, so you got it. So, like, that's a way to do it. Debugging script. What's the difference between GB, E, and GA? Uh, oh, the debuggers? No, no, like, the, uh, the condition was jump if below and equal. There is also something like... Oh, okay. Oh, G, yeah, G, B, e. It's kind of the same thing. Same instruction. Like, different, but, like, what, see. What does the, what does the B mean again? Below or equal? Less than or equal? Same difference. There's a lot of jump and like, Yeah. Who knows why? But okay. Uh, the Intel manual specifies aliases for the different jump instructions. Cool. So JBE is the same as JG. Jump below or equal is the same as. Or sorry, J and G. Jump not greater. And below or equal is not greater. So those are aliases. And um, the point is, if you're writing assembly by hand, it might be more clear um, to write one or the other. So what was but, the flag? Um, yeah, that's from I mean, that was the flag. Being, 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 being. Yeah, um, I was just showing you that as well, a demonstration. So like, what I mean is, yeah, the actual flag value, right? Yeah. So how do we print that? Uh, because you have to just include that in your debugger script. But I'm going to show you a better version. Oh. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So when you did the loop too, you know how you set the breakpoint? It will still be at the same breakpoint over and over, right? Yeah, so you can just hit continue every time. Okay. And, and then, remember 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why did you enter the A's again? Oh, so I entered the A's because a typical strategy is to enter a ton of A's and you set a breakpoint somewhere, right? And you just look in memory. You see, where are my A's? How can I like strategically mm -hmm. understand what this program is doing? Where is it putting my input? So if you type in a ton of A's, you can just look for a ton of OX41s in memory. In this particular case, I just looked for OX41 in the register. Yeah. Is there like a certain amount of A's or just type of... No, it doesn't matter. You, you're just looking for input. If you see that your A's are limited, then you know that the program is taking limited input. Okay. So, so there you go. Did that make sense to everyone? Because like, it's kind of important. The, the idea that you can just put in some kind of like jump value as long as you can recognize that input and then follow it through the execution of the program? Essentially, like, we don't want to reverse the program, but we might want to find out quickly what's happening to our input. So give it an input we know, all A's, and then just look where those A's end up, or how they're used. And to expand on that, one technique you might use in the future is doing like four A's, four B's, four C's, four D's, just to sort of figure out if the program is manipulating your data, what portions of your data is it manipulating. Um, because it's, again, yeah, just relying on our ability to learn more patterns. Yeah, they're just methods to reverse engineer a program. There's no specific way. It's just, it's just a technique that's helpful. Yeah, I'm just gonna, like, so, uh, I will go back to another script later on, demonstrating the same thing with an execution engine, uh, which is another sort of dynamic analysis technique. And I'll kind of, like, go into that now. But using your debugger isn't the only type of dynamic analysis out there. You have all of these, like, complicated strategies. Um, you have this thing called dynamic taint analysis, which sounds kind of stupid and funny, but um, <laughs> all it is is you're backtracking. So you're tracking a piece of data, and you're seeing every single basic block it's touched. That's the general idea. Um, and you can do that with dynamic analysis. And if you think, like, the real world isn't about finding flags, like, sometimes you want to just look at metrics like code coverage, and dynamic analysis is the way to do that, to test how deep is this input getting me in a program. You can think about, like, program depth. If you kind of imagine, it's a little abstract, if you kind of, like, picture the basic blocks of a program as kind of like a graph, like they're all kind of connected in some way. The more nodes you touch in the graph, the deeper you're getting in execution. So that's the general idea. That's how you test something like code coverage. So that's like a met that's where dynamic analysis would be useful and like probably a real context when you're testing you're testing like code quality or something. Um, and then you have dynamic slicing, which it's like what are the, like the set of instructions that I've touched. It's like take this line of instructions that you like every single one that this input has seen and you just grab that slice out and just look at the slice. It's kind of similar, but just different strategies. Right. Sure. Uh, not a different strategy, but maybe something you might want to try out. Uh, as like a reverse engineering exercise, some people will download uh, StarCraft 1, and I think it has like a key gen. It's like enter the key to get the full version of the game. You can attach a debugger to StarCraft, and like type in all A's into the key gen, and then track how the algorithm is checking if your key is correct or not. If you can reverse engineer that algorithm, you can give it a key that might not be valid, but to the algorithm it is valid, so then you get the full version of the game. Yeah. Bad, but, f but fun. Like, <laughs> it's, um, StarCraft for now, so. Oh. Yeah, they're like, two people are doing this shit, so, yeah. Uh, okay, well, so here, yeah, separate Yeah, related question. Is it legal to, like, reverse no. into your really I'm old kidding. games that, like, nobody buys anymore, but we can't find the people who... Isn't uh, it just legal to reverse engineer things? Is it? Say, uh, is it bad? You know, like, I'm in trouble. If you're stealing. That, that's where you... That's... It also, so, like, if... Uh, one way to, like, develop game hacks is first you reverse engineer the game and find out what yeah. areas of memory are responsible for what. Like, if you can find out what byte in memory corresponds to, like, your player's health, if you write a script that constantly makes that byte the highest value, you give yourself infinite health, right? So that's not legal at all. That is not legal. No, that's not legal, but you're not breaking any laws. Do you start breaking laws? Um, sure, let me just do that. Make a 
key gen. Right. So, are now able um, to just yeah, I took the key no, key no, but what I was trying to so say is first, if you the game the doesn't want you to so hack it, uh, uh, run. technically it's illegal. Uh, it's right. a single player game. Doesn't matter what's happening. Okay, that's true. Technically, so this program, and to this like assembly, it doesn't know what the value of that register will be because it's user input. It's again a variable. It's symbolic. You don't know. It's abstract. So, like in algebra, let's just call it x, right? And what do you know about x at that first point? Well, you know that it can be anything. Right? It can be anything. So all abstract variables are, you can think of them as uh, domain and range. Well, just, let's just give it a domain. So this constraint is true at this point of the program. Negative infinity, and let's just say that x is the unknown, or the result of get number. To positive infinity. That's true here, right? So. At this condition, basically, jump le, jump less than. You have ox92. I'll tell you now, it's referring to x. So if x is less than ox92, you're here. If x is greater than ox92, you're here. So what does that do to our domain and range at each state? It's a simple question, and it's true for both of the states. What does it do to our domain? So it's a range. No, no, don't worry about range. I'm just being oh, stupid. Okay. Just a domain. Just one range. Fuck. Okay, one range of numbers. Okay, what does that do? If you set this, if you apply this condition at this state. Does it narrow it down? Exactly. It shortens down your domain. So let's re-model uh, this. And so now, you know that x is less than ox92. 892. Wow, that's not great. But that's, yeah. So this is the constraint that's placed on your symbolic value, right? Fine. ox92, 892. And the win, what is the win constraint? Can someone tell me? Greater than ox Perfect. So x is greater than ox92, 892, right? So this is applied. And that's in this state, you know this is true. In this state, you know this is true. So me, as a CTF player, I will ask, hey, I want to get to this state. Please concretize this range or make this abstract value symbolic. Easy enough, right? All you have to do is get me a number greater than ox92. Easy. That's symbolic execution. So this idea can be expanded within an emulator. So you guys know what an emulator is, right? It's just something that executes a program within itself. It executes all the instructions within itself. So the emulator keeps track of this information. And when you ask, please concretize or give me a value, that gets me to this point, it will give you one. In this particular, it'll use um, kind of like an SMT solver, or like, basically, it'll give you one. So, OX92, 892, will, your symbolic execution API will take this symbol, and if you ask it what the value of this symbol is at this point, it'll give you a range or the concrete value. As a CTF player, you're going to say, oh, I just want a concrete value because I want a flag, I want to win. So there you go, you're done. And that's like the general idea. But like you can see, this program is really easy. Um, symbolic execution tools are smart. So they can keep everything. So they know, they have this like internal idea of what you mark as a variable or symbolic. So let's kind of look at... Oops, not that. That's my homework. So in this case, symbolic refers to something different than it is before, which was symbols were just functions. Or symbols, symbol. symbols were, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, it's different. Symbols are like, yes, in real binary, you have the symbol table. Right. But like in this case, I'm just saying that as like a variable. 
It's called symbolic execution, which is like a Greek tragedy because it's confusing, but like that's what it's called. Um, yeah. Uh, I need to find that repository. Okay, I'm just gonna kill this. You guys get the idea, right? Did you guys get it, kind of? Sort of? Yeah, is anyone like enlightened? It's my Okay. I, I sort of have a question. When is it useful to use a symbolic execution tool like anger, uh, and when is it better to just reverse the point? Um, usually when you see a very clear path to victory, you see, you understand the strategy. It's like, oh, I need to get here in execution, and I know what to feed to my execution. I know what to mark as symbolic. I don't want to reverse. Uh, I want to work on something else, so I'm going to leave this running to figure it out while I do something else. That's like a good general strategy. So, uh, an example would be like, we were talking about StarCraft before, the key gen. So you know the key gen is gonna be a similar situation. It's gonna say like, okay, your key is valid or your key is invalid, right? If you can start to um, make constraints for an input that would work, you can all of a sudden lower the, the amount of possible inputs. So like, at the start, start we said, all right, our input could be anywhere between infinity and negative infinity. But we want to just analyze the program to find out, you know, different constraints we can put on our input so we can try to get a better idea of, like, what, um, what key would work for the key. And so sometimes you'll, you're not going to get to, like, a concrete value, but you, you might get, like, a mathematical equation that's representative of a value. And, I mean, it might represent all sorts of values that work. Got it. So, in other words, like, if you know that the output of some crazy function has to be so, uh, 32, in, in the previous then example, it's it's the mm -hmm. OX892 is, is just tell it, hey, I need 32. Uh, yeah, I need to get to 32, but, like, along the way, the way yeah. but so how, how I got to 32. You just, you didn't know the variable, oh, you just looked at the you check. Know how so, you said this, gets, this it implies how that would if you're at this state, you can assume that this variable is less than OX892. Because that's what yeah. the jump said. Well, not how. But the like jump said, let me check like this value, push. and if it's less than 892. Are you talking about the final value? So, 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 we so we don't know if that's the input. input. Don't know. Like the correct you don't know, but you can going. assume yeah, this. I, I, if you if you are here, you can assume this constraint to be true. Or if you are here, you can assume that to be true. So, uh, O0, OX892 does not matter. The input that we provide to OX is Yes. I'm just saying, so other people. I know you guys know, like if you if the correct output is fifty, maybe the correct input is three. But um, three gets modified so much that eventually becomes two. Yeah. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, this is kind of like a more complicated case, but I kind of want you guys to understand what the symbolic execution engine is doing um, here. So it's get number and. You see, like, there's a lose function and a win function, but then it's doing a whole bunch of stuff to the get number, which really it's doing math. So, okay, it's doing some math to this get number, and then it's checking like, this result. So, like, yeah, you could reverse that, but let me show you with an SMT solver, kind of what I was saying before, like, how you would model this and what a symbolic execution engine is doing in the back end. So, like, you have this. Where is my stuff? Um, I'm just going to show you the source code. Well, actually, no, I'm not. So, like, this is... Is this what I was talking about? Is there a way to make the text bigger? My terminal is problematic. <laughs> Um, but this is on the GitHub, so you can just yeah, pull this up. Bin, yeah, you can just go to your bin and change the font size. Okay. Or 
just try to Oh, you just, yeah, no. just do it as a Vim thing. You made it a command. Yeah, yeah. Okay, like, I, can, I can look at the command. Okay. Well, let me just move this by. Okay. So, it's 7.05. Okay, well, I'll wrap this up in like 5 10 minutes. Um, sorry, John, I think you have time to do this thing. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Alright. Um, yeah. So. Okay, good. It is the right thing. So, you have this symbolic value, and it's doing all this math. But let's kind of look at what that means in, like, the SMT solver. So do you guys have this pulled up on your computer? It's on the GitHub, so, like, you can grab it from there. It's just a script. Um, hard one, right? Yeah, it's called hardz3.5. Yeah. Um, so you can look on your computer, but... Oh, do you know it? Why don't you open it in GitLab on or in GitHub on the computer? Oh, I can do that too. On there. Oops. Wait, I think Jaime has figured out, perhaps. No. Okay. Wait, what are you? Oh, Here, let me just do it in GitHub because I can use. Also, I have something added to the extra cache type. Right, outside. It's like a religious choice for the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, referring back, you can kind of think as int alpha. So, this is Z3. This is our SMT solver, the back end of most symbolic execution engines. So, you can kind of think what does it do? We first initiate a solver because we want a thing to do it for us. And you create a variable. In this particular case, we know the variable's name is, is an integer. So we just called it an int. And we named it alpha because I'm really bad at names, so it makes no sense. Uh, uh, also, that's a Z3 function, the int function. Yeah, that's a that's not the real int. That's, that's like a Z3 int function. Z3. It's actually a Z3 class, but Third class. so alright. You have this alpha. And referring back the binary, because it'll just help you if you look at it side by side. So, here. You can look at this addition function and just start there. You see it's OX45, right? So I create a new symbolic value. What is OX45? Where? To the right. You see that what's happening is it's adding OX45 to RBP minus hex 4, which is our symbolic value. Because you know the return value of get numbers in EAX, and you put EAX into RBP minus hex 4. And so now you know RBP minus hex 4 was our original alpha. Okay? So it adds that. So all I did was I added it. And then I basically like, uh, the next thing is subtraction. So you can like do this with all of the math operations. And then at the end, at the final result, you can say, you can add the constraint that op11, which was the last operation done, is equivalent to ox539. Um, I think I just used another binary. I think, just pretend it's ox8ca. Sure, like, and then you can like check, and then like, you can like print out the model value, which we can do, but like, I don't know, I feel like you guys are a little confused. So why do you have to do all the operations before if you just set the value at the end? Um, because you want all of these constraints to be applied to the model. Mm -hmm. So the solver needs to know that you're doing this to your symbolic data mm -hmm. or your variable, and then after you say, give me an initial value that will output, like for this to be true, um, it will. Like, it'll say, okay, I can do that. So is this, all this int class, is this something that's going to be kind of like I don't know if you could just call it like buzzing it. The Z three is going no, to no. It's actually doing. It's actually constructing a system of equations and solving it. So it's kind of working backwards. Yeah, but it, it's not really working backwards. It doesn't know anything about this binary. It's like, it, it's literally you're giving it math, 
and then it's tra it's literally figuring out the unknown. It's doing algebra. Okay. Well, that's you what, wrote a lot of more than just algebra. Yeah, you like wrote, matrix shit. You, you wrote that based on the binary. Yeah. 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 Uh, do you mind if I hop in a second? Uh, yeah, hop in while I change this. Yeah. So the way I think of it is like, we this get number that just means get an input, right? So we take an input, we do math, and then we check if the input is equal to this number, right? Is it cool if I change this thing? Or you might you keep uh, going. Essentially, what we want to do is just figure out, like, what math are we trying to do to make our original input turn into this number, right? So all we do is we put that math into the code as constraints, and we just say that we have to have an input that given when all that math is done results in that number and it solves that for you um do you guys just like want to see it run so it kind of runs it backwards basically. yeah kind of all right yeah. sure yeah. which yeah. is what you were saying but, uh, yeah uh, sorry. Is, it, is it is it supposed to uh work though since the last one is uh different or does it doesn't matter i mean it's not going to work like for this particular binary because i think i originally wrote this with another binary yeah but oh, whatever. Um, yeah, so that would have... This is it solving it for you, not putting the right value. It was so, pretty fast, but yeah. So if you enter 2,844, after it goes through all that math, it will be the correct output. And so that way you don't have to, like, you know, write down all those equations and then, you know, try to solve it by hand. Um, here's, like, an easier example. Damn it, my Python's kind of doing some stuff, but... Basically, if you think about this as like a system of equations, where you like, literally, like, let's say you're in algebra class and you get this math problem, you can do it with Z3. So like, you could say, let's create three symbolic values, that's what that's doing, called X, Y, and Z. Uh, let's make a solver, and then you can model the system of equations and then check. So it's like linear algebra. Yeah, it's literally doing linear in the pack. So if you get lazy and you don't want to do your linear homework, you just have to like model the matrices as like this, and then like do that. Or like that's uh, <laughs> back to the Starcraft example. If you can reverse the algorithm and then just write down all the the whole algorithm as a set of constraints, then you just say okay, given some input after we do the key gen algorithm check, we want it to be a certain output, and then it'll solve it for you. And it'll tell you what inputs work. Um, so Anger is like makes the sense. big brain tool for this. Yeah, yeah, does that make sense to you guys? Anger is like the big brain tool to do all this stuff. Um, I was going to go over a demo, but we're kind of running out of time. So very quickly, I'll show you another tool called Manticore. Um, and we'll go back to that StarOps challenge from before. And like maybe solve it with that. Um, and I actually use no symbolic execution uh, for the StarOps solution with Manticore. Um, but it'll just give you an idea of... Um, what, how you can modify the state outside of a debugger. Like, what can an emulator or execution engine do for you? So, it's also on GitHub. Sorry, going back to the Z3, do you need a specific Python module to reinstall? Uh, Z3 dash prover. Yeah. If you just click install Z3, it's it, like you had something totally different. Yeah, it's or annoying. Z3 dash yeah, Z3 dash prover. Or is it Python for solver? Is it solver? It's probably it's solver. solver. I don't know. I thought it was prover though. Uh, we can look that up. Yeah. So. Yeah, I do have yeah. a question. Uh, I just looked at this in Ghidra, Yeah. and Ghidra is crazy because it will, um, in the decompiler, it will look at all the adds and subtracts that were And just optimize them out. And optimize them out. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my question is, um, sort of, when do you, when do you need to use a solver, and when is it better to use a decompiler? Um, so typically you can't use a decompiler if the program is, like, hard. Right. Um, it also things it complicated if you like have a symbolic pointer, which you have a lot. And so in that like I, that was just an example. Like you saw a number and you like solved the number, but that's not like real world. Like usually it's applying these constraints to segments of memory. 
and it's saving each of these memory in a like it's you have a symbolic bit vector. There's different data types that you can cast as symbolic. So you that you saw a symbolic int. And if you see a whole bunch of mathematical operations, like really, you don't need to do any of this. You can just debug it and just look. Like, oh what is it? Oh actually you can't. Hold on, you can't because you don't know the initial value. You still have to solve back. 